For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by the generous support of the Tyndale House Foundation. For more information, visit tyndale.foundation. I think to be a good journalist, to be a good human being, is to be as empathetic and compassionate as you can be. And the way you do that is by putting yourself in the other person's shoes. What if that was me? What if I had been born in Syria, in Gaza, in Egypt, in Northern Iraq, as a Christian, as a minority? What if I was overrun? What if my home was burnt down? What if my sister was taken away and made a sex slave? What if my father was killed in front of me? I think that we always have to be, as human beings, as empathetic as we possibly can be. And that's the only way that we could share the human experience. These Christian communities are dwindling throughout the Middle East. That in a time 2,000 years ago, when they would have been the predominant force, let's say the Gaza Strip, until the fourth century was entirely Christian, they are now lonely. They are alone. They are very few. They are dwindling. They are the other. And the courage to stand up to that and to own it and to say, this is who I am. I'm a stranger in a strange land, but I believe what I believe and I'm I'm going to stay here. The amount of courage that it takes to have that, to own that, is really extraordinary to me. My book, The Vanishing, is a way of honoring these people. It's a way of me writing about them so that we never forget, but it's also a way of honoring them and the commitment they have made to stay in their ancestral lands. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. There are many ways to be a journalist in our noisy digital commons, and likely there's a place for all of them. But everyone, whether a writer or a reader, needs to ask, what is a journalist for? Presenting the truth, spreading knowledge, yes. But reporting for mere awareness pushes the question all the more for us news junkies, hooked on headlines replete with bad news. My guest today sees journalism as an endeavor of human empathy, recording the truth not from embassies or palaces or political centers, but from the leaky tents of refugee camps, telling stories not of the powerful politicians and generals executing a war, but the widows and orphans caught up in the chaos, publishing correspondence not to feed the insatiable news gluttony of American media, but to give voice to the voiceless. Janine DiGiovanni is an award-winning journalist and war correspondent and is senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. She joins me today to talk about her journalistic style and approach to human rights reporting, the alarming decimation of the Christian population in the Middle East, the difference between survival and flourishing, and what it means to adapt to being an outsider. Her latest book is The Vanishing, Faith, Loss, and the Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophets. Thanks for listening today. Janine DiGiovanni, thank you for joining me on For the Life of the World today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've described yourself in the past as a human rights reporter. I read that somewhere. I wonder if we could begin by you telling me a little bit about your background as a journalist and a war correspondent. And in particular, what do you consider the fundamental philosophical or um, moral principles that inform that vocation for you? My, this is my way of asking, why does journalism matter? And why are you a journalist? Well, that's a big question. I, I think I'll start by saying the reason I do it, and I certainly can't speak for all journalists, because we live now in a time where platforms like Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and, and all these kind of outlets are very much about the individual and kind of as a friend described it to me, the need to be seen. But I think the sort of journalism I do is much more about showing other people how they live 
especially people who are under great duress from either war or humanitarian catastrophes or people who are living, who are basically living with suffering in one way or another. And I think what I try to do is to give a voice to these people who do not have a voice, who don't have the ability to tell their own stories. So I started working a long time ago, nearly three decades ago, in the West Bank in Gaza during the first Palestinian intifada, which means uprising in Arabic. And basically, I mean, I was a very young woman and I wanted to be an academic. I didn't want to be a journalist. It never occurred to me. But I had gone to Israel, to the Holy Land, and I was absolutely horrified by what I saw, which was people who were living under extreme conditions, Palestinians who were occupied by Israeli forces and who were living in refugee camps and had been there for decades since the occupation started, and basically who had no human rights and whose dignity was being stripped from, from them. And then from there, the war in Bosnia broke out in 1992, the siege of Sarajevo, which is very sad because as we speak today, November 2021, 30 years after the war started, Bosnia is showing very dangerous signs of descending into another conflict again. So the war in Bosnia really determined and, and shaped the person I am today. Absolutely. By by living in, in a siege situation and literally like a medieval siege where there was no electricity, there was no water, people wow. were getting shot by snipers. It really formed who I am today. You're really going in a, in a direction that I wanted to ask you about, which is <laughs> describing what it's like to be a war correspondent, often caught in siege. So I wonder if you could just go a look back to that place even deeper in your memory to those assignments and in, in like these incredibly fragile and volatile locations. I wonder if you could describe what you see and what you hear and what marked you. I think what marked me was um, people who felt utterly helpless in, in, in the face of a kind of onslaught that they didn't really understand. You know, people always try to simplify it and say war is about religion or it's about ethnic tribal fighting. But in fact, to me, war is always about power and greed and money and people who want to take control and caught in it are innocent people that that can't fight back. So for me, reporting a war was always about the civilian side of it and how people endured this, whether it was Bosnia or the genocide in Rwanda or later the war in Syria, how civilians survive. And one thing that is absolutely extraordinary, the fundamental things which are really important to everyone, and I saw this during the pandemic, which is basically keeping your family safe, yourself and your family safe, trying to educate your children, keeping a roof over your head, getting food, getting water and electricity. I mean, these very basic things, how people manage that. And even in, in kind of sustained wars, like let's say Syria, which is going to be going on 11 years in, in March, right, um, 11 right. years, a long time for people to be living in, with war conditions. That means an entire generation of children grew up during a war. So you have other factors to look at, like how did you educate those children? Did you educate right. them at all? Or is there an, an entire generation that doesn't know how to read and write? For people that are refugees, and in, in terms of the Syrian war, remember there was millions of people that were forced to flee their country. How do you maintain the identity of your country? How do you teach yeah. your kids that you're still Syrian? What does the Syrian flag look like? So it's less about me, I'm talking about, and more about like how people live. You asked me about how war reporters do it. You know, everyone is different and everyone has a different mission or vocation or calling and mine was very much to try to record and gather evidence that could potentially be used in war crime tribunals, but also mm. so that people could never say this didn't happen. Right. Genocide deniers or, um, you know, which very much right now with Srebrenica, the genocide of Srebrenica in Bosnia mm-hmm. in 1995, There are people that genuinely say this didn't happen. It's a myth. It's a fantasy. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, it did happen. And I have the testimonies of survivors and the testimonies of families 
And it's there in black and white. So people can never say this didn't happen. And my other real mission is to try to give people some kind of agency or dignity by letting them tell their stories. So I think by letting them control the narrative of what happened to them, and it's always about what happened to people. What, how did you get here? What happened? To you? By letting them tell their story, it, I think it gives them some degree of control rather than a feeling of utter helplessness. And while I'm speaking, I'm thinking of like all of the many people who I've sat with, thousands of people over the years sure. um, in, in refugee camps or sitting with them in their tents or under a bridge on a road or in a, a settlement or what happened to you? How did you get here? Tell me your story. And, and that's what I try. That's what I try to do. Not different can... from what you're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this connection between giving voice to the voiceless and giving agency through the telling of a story, I mean, that's a real beautiful way that I can see now what it means to be a human rights reporter. Is that part of what you meant when you called yourself that? Yes. I mean, I'm certainly not a tabloid reporter and I'm certainly not a sensationalized mm -hmm. reporter. No. And I think when you don't I, read like that, <laughs> when I would go to these places, I knew that what I was doing was very different from what my colleagues were doing, or most of them. A lot of my colleagues were focused on investigations or the role that American foreign policy played in it, or breaking news. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is just a very different thing from what I do. What I mm -hmm. do is I go somewhere and I try to embed with communities and I try to stay for as long as I can. You have to gain people's trust. So if you're a TV reporter and you kind of rock up to, let's say, people whose village has just been raided by a militia and they've been burnt out of their homes, women have been taken away, you're not going to get people's trust by pointing a microphone in their face and saying, how do you feel? And you have, you're dressed up in a suit and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you got helicoptered in work. by your American network that pays you $5 million a year. I, you know, mm, I, yeah. It's a very different thing. And yes, listen, those kind of reporters do have a role because they have to, they're bringing a story to millions and millions and millions of people. Right. And my readers and the people who follow me are usually very different kinds of people. They want a deeper, more nuanced story of what, what happens in these places. And this book, The Vanishing, was really came from, first of all, my own personal faith. And my, my many years of working in the Middle East and being fascinated by Christianity in the Middle East and how it has survived thousands and thousands of years, despite plagues, disease, pandemics, armies that wanted to slaughter them, radical forces, climate change, migration, and yet they're still there. So I really wanted to document these Christian communities before they disappear. And that is my worry. And, and many social scientists working in the region feel that, will they be here in a hundred years at the rate that their communities are dwindling? So that's really why this book was very important for me to write. And it's something that's been on my mind for many years, because even in the war in Bosnia, which was a war of Greek, sorry, Serb Orthodox forces subjugating and trying to exterminate Bosnian Muslims, but also Croat Christians, Catholics. So in a mm -hmm. sense, religion was involved in that war. That's not what it, it was about. Again, going back to my original point, it was about power and control and nationalism. But, you know, even back then, I was thinking all the time about how these groups, Christians in the Balkans, Christians in Africa, Christians in the Middle East, sustain their faith and how they kept going through tre tremendous turmoil and events that seemed to overtake them. But mm. still, they clung, they clung to God and their belief. And that, to me, was really remarkable. Yeah, it is. Let's talk a little bit about that personal faith that you brought up. What, what kind of perspective are you coming from? I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. I went to Catholic schools until I was 16. I really resisted the Catholic education I had. It was very strict. I was raised mm -hmm. by nuns. It was the 70s and 80s. So it was 
a very different church than the one now. So, I mean, the kind of minutia of it annoyed me and I was a yeah. rebel. So, of course, I rebelled against it. But yeah. the fundamental principles of it have stuck with me and carried through for my entire life. I mean, for instance, today, it's a cold day in New York City. Mm-hmm. And I woke up and I made breakfast for my son And I looked at our rows of coats that we have. And I said to him, be sure to wear a warm coat because it's cold today. And then I looked and I thought, gosh, we have like five coats each. And I live on the Bowery in New York City, which has been gentrified, but there's still a lot of people who don't have homes. And it really, it really troubles me. They had a mother once. They had a life. Many of them are Vietnam vets or they're people that have fallen on hard times it's something that could happen to me or you very easily, right? It right. could happen to any of us to slip between the cracks and to be completely unseen. So so today, I just literally, before I got on the call with you, I went and I laid out a couple coats. And, and when we get off the phone, I'm going to walk down 2nd mm-hmm. Avenue in the Bowery and see who needs a coat. That's good. Um, and that's something that fundamentally, I think, is what Christ taught us. It's about loving your neighbor and looking after your neighbor and believing that we are all in this together. And if we don't take care of each other, what is the point? So that, like whether I'm doing that on the Bowery or whether I'm doing it in a war zone by by recording someone's story, to me, it's the same thing. It's It's, neighbor love. Yeah, it's about love. And I wrote in the final chapter of my book, um, The Vanishing, all of the Christians I spoke to hmm. had one fundamental thing that linked them, and it was love. It was love, whether it was a love of their God or a love of life that, or a love of their fellow man that made them who they were. Yeah. For me, God and church is something deep within you, and it's how you live your life every day. And you're finding a deep expression of it in the work that you're doing around the world. So I'd like to want to wander into the vanishing a little more with talking again about your style. So your journalistic style is unique to me and captured me. And I think it's because the way you write brings the reader quite close to the situation. And uh, and some of the phrases that that I would refer to here, I'd I'd quote uh, your own writing to you here is you talk about people you met discussing, quote, how would they rebuild their shattered churches and charred homes pockmarked with shells and bullet holes. There's another short passage, quote, wandering through the camps, I stopped to talk to families. I sat inside dark tents with old women who were baffled as to why they were there. Are they trying to kill us all? One woman asked me are we ever going to be able to go home? And reading those words and having that entered into the record, right? The journalistic record of history so that this can't be ignored. I think that's different than the sensationalized journalistic media that all of us have a daily dose of. But that bringing the reader close is a beautiful thing and really does serve to speak to the dignity of the individual. Thank you for that. Thank you for being so attentive to that. I just think, so my mentor, who was an Israeli Jewish lawyer who defended Palestinians in military court, said Mm. to me many years ago, if you have the ability to go to these places and bring the story to other people, then you have the obligation. The two different passages were both in northern Iraq. The first one was I was talking about the churches in the Christian Assyrian and Chaldean villages outside of Mosul. And the second one was a refugee camp in in Doha for internally displaced people, the Christians that had been driven off their homes or their homes were burned. And they were Mm. living in these tents. And and the confusion and the frustration and the the fear that people feel is, is very real. So I think in order to describe that, Let's say to my mother's priest, Father Al, who is a priest in a a small parish in Red Bank, New Jersey, right? If he will know very, he will know about the Christians in the Middle East because he studied the Gospels. But to describe what they are feeling now, I think as much detail as you can give, that also 
lets people relate to them. Because it mm-hmm. could, again, it could be you, it could be me, it could be anyone. And one of the other things I learned about being in war zones is that they have, war comes very quickly. And that's why the pandemic really scared me. Because one minute, you're literally living your life the way you live it, walking your kid to school. I just described to you walking my kid to school, stopping for eight o'clock mass, sure. maybe afterwards getting a coffee somewhere, then going and sitting at my desk and working, taking the train up to Yale to teach. You're living your routine and then suddenly that all falls apart, like in a matter of days, hours. Wow. And Sarajevo was a really good example of it. There was a referendum. People didn't believe war would come to them. And then suddenly there were tanks rolling down the street. Yeah. Is Islamic State 2014, people stayed in their homes in northern Iraq, the, the Christian villages. They heard about these people, these radical extremists that were coming. They didn't believe, they didn't believe it would happen. And until the last minute, as long as they could stay, they did. And that's yeah. why literally people had to flee with nothing more than the clothes on their backs, their documents if they were lucky, their children, and they climbed into their cars and they took off. But in some cases, it was too late. So that's why I try to bring that detail to the reader, because I think the more the reader can visualize that person, the more they can put themselves in their shoes. And I think to be a good journalist, to be a good human being, Hmm. is to be as empathetic and compassionate as you can be. And the way you do that is by putting yourself in the other person's shoes. What if that was me? What if I had been born in Syria, in Gaza, in Egypt, in Northern Iraq, as a Christian, as a minority? What if I was overrun? What if my home was burnt down? What if my sister was taken away and made a sex slave? What if my father was killed in front of me? I think that we have to always, we always have to be as human beings, as empathetic as we possibly can be. And that's the only way that we could share the human experience. Well, in a journalism that's grounded in that empathy, you're going to see a marked difference between a journalism that is grounded in power play or, or money or fame. I mean, it really is revealed in the very style that you take. Jumping off of that experience, the family that is truly waiting until the very last minute because there is that hope that they might be able to stay in their own home. And then having to make that split second decision for survival. It brings up a statement that you heard from someone, I believe also in Iraq, who was talking about celebrating the fact that we still exist. And it really boiled things down to a question of survival. And I wonder if if you could talk about that mentality in The Vanishing of celebrating just the mere fact of existence. Yes. Well, you know, when I was a little girl at Catholic school, we studied the, the Christian martyrs, the Christians who were persecuted during Roman times. And I, even when I was a child, I remember thinking, how extraordinary these people, the Christians praying in the catacombs, but also that their faith was so important and so strong that they were willing to die often terrible deaths in, in under Roman torture, persecution, yeah. extreme persecution. These Christians remaining in the lands I talk about, and I talk about it divided into four areas, Christians in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, and in the Gaza Strip. Mm-hmm. They are, and I think it's hard for people, especially in America where Christianity is the predominant religion or Europe, to understand how it feels to be a minority and to be in the case of what happened to the Christians in Iraq and Syria in 2014, to have an extremist group who wants to exterminate you, yeah, who literally wants to wipe you off the face of the earth because of what you believe in. Yeah, the cleansing of Christians. The cleansing of Christians, the eradication of Christians, the vanishing of Christians. And I think that it's really hard to believe that in some places in Egypt, you 
you cannot build a church. It is enshrined in the law, in the constitution, that it is illegal to build churches. And this is despite the fact that for Egyptian Copts, their churches get burnt down and then they cannot build another one. Or for Christians in Iraq who literally were driven off their land or those who stayed had the letter N painted above their door and for Nazarene, which has terrible connotations, of course, of European, of the Nazi years in Europe. Certainly does. Yeah. Um, A terrible, terrible image, uh, a very evocative. Or if you were a Christian and your daughters were taken away and sold in markets, or if you were subjugated, your, your farms taken or you were forced to pay a tax, or you were forced to convert to, to Islam. So very hard to imagine this. And yet, this is what is happening. I focused on the Middle East. I do want to make the point that this is happening in other parts of the world. Certainly, um, yeah. In Africa, for instance, in northern Nigeria. I, years ago, went and reported on Christian communities there, who, again, were being burnt out of their homes, whose families were being burnt alive, but who continued to pray and who continue to believe in God. Now that takes a kind of courage that is absolutely extraordinary. I have to say, I don't know if I, and I say this with all honesty, if Mm -hmm. confronted with that kind of fear and to protect my family, if I could hold up under that, or if I would say, okay, yes, I'll convert. I'm being really honest here. I'd have to be the same that that I I think... But this is the exact implication of what you're talking about with perspective taking of the other. What, in fact, would I do? What and what can I, how can I honor the fact that these people have chosen and made the decision that they did? And they certainly did. And they, they remain in their ancestral lands. And the point of my book, The Vanishing, is to really try to, to honor these people that have decided to stay in their ancestral lands, because if they go, their communities will disappear forever from the face of the earth. And social scientists in Iraq, for instance, believe that the population, which went from in Saddam days, and it's very hard to give numbers because um, the last census was taken around 40 years ago. There were 1.5 million Christians in Iraq, and now they estimate 150,000, and that's a pretty good count. So these numbers are dwindling. People are leaving? And how do we make them stay there? The Pope Francis's visit last spring yeah. was just remarkable. Yeah, that was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I, I know the Catholic Church is taken a beating and should do for the pedophilia and the suffering it has caused, uh, caused unknown number of young men and women. But Pope Francis, I feel, has done remarkable things. And I think that his Going to Iraq at the height of COVID, when everyone advised him not to go, he went. And he went to show Christians there that there is solidarity, that people are watching, that they are not alone. And that is the strongest message of faith we could possibly send to them. Yeah. You talk about a an Assyrian Catholic town just outside Mosul, where you heard about the kind of anxiety that even with ISIS no longer a threat, they felt threatened by emigration. People are leaving every day is what they said. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the feeling of threat that 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 is. I mean, it must be one of loneliness, one of fear, one of insecurity. Can you say a little bit more about what it means for our enemy to be emigration for those Christians? Absolutely. I mean, look, and again, put yourself in their shoes. If you had family in the U.S. or in Canada or in Sweden or in a country where you could go and you could worship the way you wanted to without fear of persecution and you'd be able to get a job and you can't get a job in Iraq now, wouldn't you go? I mean, given that choice to raise your family in peace, to be able to pray in peace, to have a better opportunity, a better life, to be able to pursue dreams and education. Or even to hold a job. Yeah. Yeah. So you're confronted with that. Or you say, but if I go, many others will go. And then our community here will cease to exist. 
Mm. So some of the bishops at the time of ISIS in Iraq had a real dilemma because their parishioners were flocking to them saying, what should I do? I have family in Canada, I have family in the US, I can go. The Trump, of course, the, the Muslim ban 2016, 2017, which came later, mm. prohibited Muslims from coming to America, but it didn't prohibit Christians from Arab lands. Yeah. So they could still get in, which is a whole other issue because it created this dichotomy of good refugees, i.e. Christian, versus bad refugees, i.e. Muslim, terrible representation. But anyway, they were faced with this choice. Like, do you go and have a better life or do you stay so that you have more children, your children have children, generations continue in the land where your ancestors have lived for 2000? Terrible weighted decision to make. This question of leaving or staying and what faithfulness requires of a person. I mean, it's the question of one's loyalty or, or fidelity to a place. And and seeing not just your own survival, but the survival of that cultural identity in that place. Yes, very much. And one of the passages of my book, a very clear memory I have in northern Iraq, they have these beautiful monasteries, which are usually carved out of mountains. And one evening wasn't yet evening. It was kind of the sun was setting. I climbed the hill and the mountain and got to this monastery and I could hear and these are ancient monasteries that are going back to the fourth, fifth century. I could hear this angelic singing, like a kind of chanting. And of course, the Christians in Iraq speak Aramaic, which is the language of Christ, ancient language. And um, I could hear this chanting, this singing, and I followed it through this, these ancient rooms with very low ceilings, almost like a cave, yeah. going down passageways and... And I just kind of followed the the sound of these voices. And I finally got to this room that was completely lit with candles. It was getting dark. And mm. there was a Chaldean priest there reciting Evensong. And it was probably the same way people have prayed and chanted and sung for thousands of years. And yet it was a 20, I don't know, 17, 16 when I, when that happened. And Afterwards, when he was done with his prayers, we went outside and we talked and he just basically told me how important it was the Christians stayed in Iraq, that absolutely their permanence in that land was an absolute requirement for the country to exist as it always has, how important they were to the whole fabric of society. And it was a memory I'll have for the rest of my life. It was so haunting and so beautiful. Um, resonated so much about their faith, their powerful faith. It was really beautiful. Actually, I'm recalling you're writing about this very, this very memory of yours. And I, I want to read this quote uh, from the priest there. Was it Father Royal? Yes. Yes. I mean, he says, even amidst the face of the Christian faith diminishing there, he says this quote, this is our roots. For people moving from the east to the west, it is very difficult because they will assimilate and we will disappear forever. The west is technology, knowledge. The east is something more traditional. If something is demolished, it can never again be rebuilt. Yeah, very powerful words. And it was a very powerful moment. And I think that kind of defines the whole tone of my book. I really wanted to stress how rooted these people are to their land and how the faith is so embedded in, in the land as well. And when you think too, this is the land of the prophets and these people are direct descendants of the prophets and the apostles. And it's where the apostles went to, to bear witness, to bring people to their flock, to convert, to bless the land. It's the same land that that they walked on and really remarkable. And I had the same feeling when I went to some of the monasteries in the desert in Egypt, the monastic life and the purity of it. I have to say it's very, I'm sure I couldn't live like that. Mm. But I do go into those monasteries in Egypt or in Iraq or in Syria. As the war was starting, I went to this really extraordinary monastery in Malula and there were nuns there making jam and living kind of very simple life. And I remember thinking, 
It's so peaceful here. What they have is their very simple life, their prayers, their devotion to God. There's no distractions from cell phones, podcasts, newspapers. They might have had a radio or something, but they live this very pure, very simple life. And strangely, during pandemic, that's what some of us got back to. It makes sense of these simple practices, but ones which are embedded deeply in not just a person's life, but in a sort of genealogy or a chronology that these practices have been passed down for so long. The fidelity to reenacting that, right? And that's the point of the mass. But the reenactment there is is this expression of faith and an expression of how they understand what it means to be human in those cases. Yes, you know, however you look at it, whether you're a Catholic, a Unitarian, a Lutheran, a Baptist, or whether you just have your own hybrid, which is what I am, essentially, it made me feel closer to something greater than me. And I think that's what this book is really about, that there is something greater than all of us. And the people I wrote about, these extraordinary Christians of the Middle East that are hanging on, that are trying to stay in their ancestral lands, how they tapped into something greater than them to give them the faith to remain in their homes. And that's Mm. really what The Vanishing is about. Jeannie, so you met another priest, Father Andrew Toma, in Marmatai, right? Yes. And what he's bringing up is adapting to being an outsider. He says, you know, that the Christians in his village are leaving because there's no life for them. And how can he tell them to stay? How can I save them? I can't even save myself. And that adaptation to being an outsider is this really evocative phrase for what I think of as a political theology through the lens of Christianity, which is that of identifying with the marginalized, identifying with the widow and the orphan, It's very much a piece with the style of journalism that you're about. But I have to say, it seems like U.S. Christians in America are more adapting to being an insider. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit about what you've learned from Father Toma and and others about adapting to being an outsider. I think as you were saying that, I kept thinking of someone I met in Egypt, a, a Copt, a Christian Copt, who said all her life she felt different. The people treated her because she was Christian in a predominantly Muslim society, that she was the other. And the way she described it was that she felt like she was always wearing different clothes, that her outside, how people perceived her was so radically different from the way they lived and they weren't looking inside at all. Mm. And I just, I found that such an incredible, incredible way of describing it, feeling like the other people looked at her as though she just was so different from them. Yeah. And yet she is the same. And I think that the way what Father Toma was talking about was that because these Christian communities are dwindling throughout the Middle East, that in a time 2000 years ago, when they would have been the predominant force, let's say the Gaza Strip until the fourth century was entirely Christian. They are now lonely. They are alone. They are very few. They are dwindling. They are the other. And the courage to stand up to that and to own it and to say, this is who I am. I'm a stranger in a strange land, but I believe what I believe and I'm, I'm going to stay here. And again, we talked about courage, but the amount of courage that it takes to have that, to own that, is really extraordinary to me. My book, The Vanishing, is a way of honoring these people. It's a way of me writing about them so that we never forget, but it's also a way of honoring them and the commitment they have made to stay in their ancestral lands. Our center, we we teach an undergrad class at Yale called Life Worth Living, where it's an approach to thinking about human flourishing through the lens of the lived practice of a variety of different faith and philosophical traditions. So I ask you, what is a life worth living? And in particular, what is flourishing when survival is in question? 
Wow, what a great question. Of course, that's a very individual question. If you ask me that, I'm going to give you a different answer than a Christian I might meet in Dohuk, Iraq would answer. I think a life worth living is a life where you feel fulfilled, that you've reached your own potential in whatever it is. And again, everyone's everyone's route, everyone's road is very different. My my expectations of myself might be very different than your expectations of yourself. But again, I think it's a life that you live for other people as well. I mean, the selfishness that we've come to, um, you know, the world is too much with us, I think has distracted many people from why we're here at all, which is in some way to make a mark, to leave your mark behind. But that mark should be to some extent by helping other people, by helping those who don't have the opportunities you've had or the opportunities or the luck. When I'm in a refugee camp or I'm with people who are, have endured terrible loss, I always think it's always by chance. It's only by luck that I was born where I was born. And I wasn't born in Homs or Aleppo or Srebrenica or Kigali or the Congo. Um, I was born where I was born. And because I've had that privilege to live a relatively secure and safe life where I've never had to worry about where my next meal is coming from. Well, I have when I lived in war zones, but essentially I could get out of war zones. I have a place to go to. I have some money in the bank. I'm safe then I have an obligation and a duty to help people that don't. And my way of helping, you know, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer, but I am a writer and I can tell their story and I can let other people listen to it so that maybe they will be moved to then do something and pass that on. So it's a chain effect, basically. If I'm training my students at Yale now to be, global leaders, but global leaders with compassion and empathy so that if they go out and learn how to end wars, they're diplomats or they go work for the UN or the World Bank or whatever, that they're doing it with a certain amount of compassion, empathy, and absolute feeling of putting themselves in the shoes of someone else, especially when it comes to those who've been blighted by war or humanitarian catastrophes. So that's what I do, and that would be my answer to how I live a life that's fulfilled and a life that's worth living. Janine D. Giovanni, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for sharing it with us today. Thank you, Evan. It's been a pleasure. is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured journalist and war correspondent Janine DiGiovanni. Production assistance by Martin Chan, Nathan Jowers, Natalie Lamb, and Logan Ledman. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, with the occasional midweek. If you're new to the show, we're so glad that you found us. Remember to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you've been listening for a while, Thank you, friends. If you're liking what you're hearing, I've got a request. Would you support us? It's pretty simple, really, and won't take much time. Here are some ideas. First, you could hit the share button for this episode in your app and send a text or email to a friend or share it to your social feed. Second, you could give us an honest rating on Apple Podcasts. How are we really doing? Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are cool because they'll help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about and what's most meaningful to you, our listeners. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.